back where the search started 14 years ago. Queens, that's where the New York City Football Club will christen their new soccer stadium at Willits Point. Interesting, their opponent for this week, New England, the lone MLS team out of the 29 right now that doesn't have a plan for a specific stadium. We're also going to talk some footy here on live NYCFC Views. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. The Sick Podcast. NYCFC Views. Collins approaches the shot, and New York City wins the first MLS Cup on their first try. And they're going crazy. Tiretino y gol! Gol! New York City is el campeón. The Major League Soccer! The sickest New York City FC podcast. It's gonna be sick. Welcome, everybody. I'm Glenn Crooks, along with uh, Roberto Abramowitz. Uh, coming up this Saturday, we will do it again. We'll be on the radio or your digital audio streaming service presenting the live commentary of New York City this week playing New England. Uh, but first, we've got to get to the soccer stadium news. But very first, Roberto, I, I, one of the things I love about living in the New York, New Jersey area is how artsy it is. I know there's other parts of the country that are artsy as well. But uh, last night, I took my son, who is a guitarist, into uh, New York City, Sony Hall, to see Al Demiola. Now, I don't know how much of our audience, if any of them, uh, know of Al Demiola, played for Return to Forever. I know you know Roberto. And the guy, number one, he's 69 years old. He, I mean, what he can do. I have such a great appreciation for these guys and women who maintain excellence as the years go on. And why are you looking like that? Because some people because get old and don't play anymore. Well, I, I get it, but like I'm 67 and I feel that within two years I can still do what I do and do it well as opposed to, you know, what you're saying yeah. that it's 69, you know, that's playing, like ancient. I, I take offense to this. That you're talking about speaking. This is playing an instrument, a guitar, very intricate in the, you know, what happens here, what happens here. and I know how guitars work, Lynn. No, but... Well, I'm glad you took it to another level of, of lack of appreciation for people doing no, this. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. But the way you mentioned it, it was like 69. Like, wow, he's not dead yet. It's amazing he can still walk onto the stage. All right. Forget it. Do you have a drip even, with him? Forget I even talked about it. Except I do <laughs> want to tell you that, first of all, I would – see this? <laughs> you could actually go – He's got these home events. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you the price in a minute. But what it says is, enjoy an exclusive evening for two. He lives in uh, Old Tapan, New Jersey. Grew up in uh, Bergenfield, New Jersey. He's a Jersey boy, which puts him on, on another level as well. Enjoy an evening for two at Al's house in New Jersey. A gourmet dinner. Apparently, he's a cook. He's Italian, so he gives you this three-course meal. Uh, private show. Guitar lesson. And a jam, you can jam with him if you play. And then you can pick between his PRS electric or ovation acoustic to uh, to uh, take home. Take home. So you, you, oh it's, one of these things, it's one of these things where, you know, you go, you go to the, uh, the the Q code and, 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 and then. How much is that worth? I mean, that's amazing. It is. It was, uh, excuse me, I dropped some. $7,500 a piece. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's a now, little bit. It's a little bit now, out of my budget. I would like. I wish he had like a you know a cheaper version where you just come for dessert and a couple of songs. But uh, yeah, if if you had, or the money, like if he played in a venue with you know several other people, and that would you know be able to lower the price per person. Oh, that's what you did last night. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> and I've seen him solo twice, and then last night was with a band, uh, electric and with acoustic. He, he brought in a, a, a flamenco acoustic guitarist who sat with him for about a half hour, and they oh, that must be amazing. Ripped out this stuff. That's I'll send you uh, some of the uh, video I took. But anyway, so that's um, um, you know we often likes to like to start the uh, show with personal stuff. So that yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm I'm oh, just as an aside, 
And as an addition element, I'm going to go back to Sony Hall with my son, Ryan, to see Martin Barr. Now, I don't know if you know who he is. No, that I don't he know. He was the lead guitarist for years for Jethro Tull. And I went on YouTube and saw a recent performance. The guy is crazy good still. I'm not going to say his age, and I'm not going to try to offend you, the 67-year-old. Thank but, you. <laughs> I will say that uh, I can't wait for that. That's in May because he's going to play all Tull stuff. So, oh, uh, that's great. Yeah. Sony Hall. Let me know. Let, let, let me know more about that. I may, if I have time, uh, go and get a seat. If you have time, okay. I want to see your calendar. You'll have time. My God, you have no idea. Here we go. Anyway, soccer stadium news. So yes. it seems like we've gotten this piecemeal over the years, but this year in particular has been this these solid. First, we got the renderings, you know which uh, really added to the excitement, I think, for everyone that it's like, wow, that's it's going to look like that. It's going to be right there next to City Field. You know, so it, it's going to have, you know, that European with the roof, you know, the semi roof or whatever you call that. I don't know all the architecture. No, it's a roof. It's, it goes over the entire uh, seating area, it seems. You know, over right. the entire. I was going to say bowl, but it's not a bowl because they decided to make it a uh, rectangle as opposed to a bowl. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, uh, so that was nice. And then these, these different, um, we had Chris Campbell on here on the podcast, uh, not too long ago and to give us an update as to where approval stuff was. Well, yesterday there was this, uh, you know, massive celebration at city hall supporters were there, uh, and Francisco Moya was there who, uh, you know, the queen's, uh, a city councilman who has, has played such a big role in um, this coming to fruition, along with the mayor, Eric Adams, who he's hugging right there. Those two in particular. And there's uh, Francisco with uh, with Maxi Morales, who's uh, also happy. We got the, the third rail, uh, Los Templados. Uh, yes. So uh, a lot of great representation yesterday to, uh, to celebrate. Because the only thing remaining, right, there's not going to be a shovel to the ground yet is Mayor Adams has to uh, sign a document within the next five days. Now, I would, unless the ink r runs dry in his pen, uh, we know this is happening. So, uh, so Roberto, as I've said before, you are a season ticket holder, and we've done the commentary since the first kick. So it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, I hope uh, I hope we're still around to uh, to help Chris in the stadium in 2027. But regardless, uh, really exciting news. It's tremendous news, and uh, the vote was forty-seven to one. And I've been trying to find. Oh, I mean, we gotta I get to really... one. Let's get to one on here. Let's get him, a, a, him or her. I on. wanted to know who the one was, and I, I, I don't know if you found it, but I mean, I, I didn't have a ton of time yesterday. I did a little surface oh, looking, and I couldn't knows. find to see who the vote was. If somebody knows, knows, let us know. If somebody yeah. knows, let us know, and then we'll invite them on the show, and then just to see what the what, what their thoughts are. I, because I mean, I, I mean, if you have a contrary opinion to the stadium because of some uh, particularly so, good reason, then, you know, let's hear it. Contrary, I mean, some of the things that I had heard throughout the process was that a lot, some of the politicians were upset that the that the housing portion of it was only 2,500 and it wasn't more. I think that the original proposal way back when was 5,000 and then for whatever reasons it couldn't be accomplished right. at 5,000 and they cut it to 25. And so there was a lot of uh, people who were you know, upset about that, but 2,500 20, pieces, you know, 2,500 apartments is still a very, very good number, especially in a city right now that desperately needs lower income housing. So, um, you know, the school is there, the library is there, all these other components, there's going to be commercial components, just the fact that they're going to clean up that area because it was literally gross with all the, uh, you know, car, what is it, uh, junkyards that, that were there, uh, the chop, chop shops and all well, of that. Well, that almost gives a connotation of illegality. They're not, they're not illegal, they were just part places. So... Which we've um, all called, which we've all named over the years since I can remember as chop shops. But go ahead. Well, 
May, but that always gave a connotation that they were doing something illegal and they're not doing anything. These are not doing anything illegal that we know of. That's just happened to be that where we they know were. Of. I mean, that there's we know no of. drainage there, no nothing. That we so know they of. really have to redo the entire area first. That we know of. We didn't, did we know Otendi's uh, uh, agent was, uh, it took 61, 16 what, 16 million. million dollars from his bank account to make bets. Oh my God. That's incredible. That, that, that really is. is. He's in yeah. big trouble. He's so, in big, uh, big trouble. So here we go. So, uh, uh, and I know you, uh, you forwarded a, a, an email that the season ticket holders uh, received from the club. So the actual, uh, I guess soon you'll be able to um, get your seats. Is that what that was about? What was that about? No, I don't know soon. I mean, they still have a while to go. I don't think that's really happening until construction is almost complete. And then you can literally, normally what the, what winds up happening in those situations is that the stadium is completed or almost completed. And then they let you sit in different areas and say, okay, well, I'll take this seat or I'll take whatever other seat, you know, that you like. So, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the process. But the fact that this has happened sort of quickly relative to, you know, uh, other stadiums and what it could have been. And the mayor now has five days to sign on, and that's fait accompli because he's the one who's pushing for this whole thing. So that's going to happen. Um, they're going to be able to get shovels into the ground rather soon. And uh, that means that the cleanup can happen quickly. I mean, that's already sort of started in some of the areas that are around where the stadium is going to be. And, uh, you know, so that also gives it a very, very good chance that not only is the stadium going to be done on time, but as Francisco Moya intimated to you in your conversation with him last season, when you had him on uh, at halftime of your radio uh, broadcast, um, that it may even be done in 2026. So, I mean, the good team memory. isn't talking about that. Good memory. The team yeah, isn't talking about that, but the no. fact of the matter is that as everything is coming out, that possibility, as they like to say, is uh, it's a definite possibility. Yeah, why not? Yeah, and he did say that. And I, I have to be honest. I was digging around for that interview today to to sh to play, and I'm glad you brought it up uh, because uh, he he didn't bring it up just to to say it. He just, I, you know, I don't I don't know what his, uh, you know, the the background of the information that he had uh, that would uh, would make him believe that it could be 26. I suppose it could be a pipe dream, but 26 is the World Cup year, and boy, it would be pretty cool to be able to open it up in the at the World Cup. Well, during the World Cup, or well, in, in that season. I don't think MLS is going to be playing at that time. But um, what what winds up being so everything so far is going well, and they're going to be able to get, as I said, shovels into the ground at when they thought they were going to, or even earlier. So that's good. The, the biggest problem with these sort of things in this part of the country is normally weather. Now, with global warming, at least the last two winters have been very good. You know, it's been warm. We've almost had no snow. So, you know, those are the sort of things that can wind so, up delaying something. So you attribute that, so you attribute that to global warming? I, I didn't know you were a scientist. I didn't oh, know you were a scientist. Well, that's what everybody Everybody in the science world seems to be attributing to. So I listen to them. You know, I go to doctors. <laughs> I listen to science. So I, the scientist says, I, this is I what it is. Well. This I is what it well. is. But I'm glad you, that you made as that somebody, As somebody who just got their life saved by science, I'm going to say I'm fine with science and quoting science. So um, anyway, so if the winters continue to be warm, and we hope that they are, uh, then uh, you know it may you know it may help you know get uh, get this done sooner. Obviously, the cleanup is going to be huge. You know because sometimes when they start digging into the cleanup, and I think this happened to Red Bull Arena when they started because their land was contaminated as well, that they ran into some issues there, and th and that sort of like pushed everything back a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. if they can get through that quickly, and that seems to be fine. I mean because they, I presume they expect it to be horrific, and they've they've already built that into the timeline. So, um, and then they can go uh, from there. Who knows? And everything will be good. You ever thought, of, who knows what they'll find underneath that ground? You know, I mean, it, it, who knows? <laughs> she was, that's a lot of years of, I don't know. You know, remember the it, mafia was about in that area. Who, one point. You know, <laughs> what they might find is like, who they might find. Or who, who they might find. All right. So, uh, I mean, the fact that there was, the, the, it's really official, uh, you know, until the mayor, we know. But like you said, it's a foregone conclusion. So that's very cool. Deal. 
Very cool. All right, let's get to the most recent game. We had uh, New York City FC uh, hosting Atlanta United at City Field. It was the first match of the year at City Field. So maybe uh, apropos that the stadium announcement comes the same week that uh, New York City makes their uh, debut in Queens. Uh, yeah, there's no other way to classify this than uh, a disappointing result. Mm -hmm. uh, season high, 23 shots, not many of them on target. Uh, Montsef Bakrar, your striker, had five shots, none of them on target. Montsef Bakrar, your striker, still with zero goals in yeah. 2024. Jovan Mijatovic, who might have been a candidate, well, certainly would have been a candidate to maybe either get a shot at this or at least come in at some point in, in the second half of games to, to have an effort uh, at it is uh, stuck in Serbia uh, with the visa issues at the moment. So uh, New York City really doesn't have a backup striker unless you consider Alonso Martinez that. So here we go, Roberto. I mean, you know, Sandy Rodriguez had the game of his life, I thought, and uh, drew the penalty, scored the penalty, and then, but giving up uh, that equalizer, Guzan getting an assist. I mean, it was it was crazy. But uh, what are your initial it's thoughts a, here before I get to a couple of Nick clips? The, the New York City played well, shows the potential of what this team can be, which I think is a good team and uh, uh, and could be a very good team. But their margin of error is so thin by the fact that they're not scoring goals. And so anything that goes bad in the back gets magnified by the fact that they're not scoring. So if they gave up that goal, but they had, you know, I think what was their expected goals? Now, big thing with the kids, Glenn, I, I want you to know that. The uh, kids? Yes, it's uh, 2.4 was the expected goals. New York City got one. I, I mean, they had opportunities to score maybe three or four goals, uh, good opportunities to score three or four goals in this game, and they didn't. And so if you do get that, Right. Then if you give up that one goal, you don't really care. Right. I mean, you care, but it's not a big deal. But 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 because the fact that the margins of error are so small because of the deficiencies up front, then it is. And then you see Monsef, and he's really struggling mentally with the fact that his body language after every miss shows that it's the pressure has absolutely gotten to. Well, him, can I cut right? you off there? Can I cut yes. you off there? Let's play Nick. Uh, this is from my pregame uh, interview, which will air in its entirety, 7.15 on Saturday on the New York City FC Network, where both Spanish, Roberto, and English, myself, will uh, air beginning with our pregames at 7.15. But uh, this was Nick on the subject of Bakrar in our conversation. We'll be able to talk about Monsef Bakrar with you one week after he has uh, broken the slump, but it didn't happen yet. Uh, five shots, two were blocked, three others off target. And to me, the one he dragged to the left, that was the one where I thought, during commentary, we thought a little tight, not confident. You know, I know you're trying to build this kid's confidence, but it seems to be, kind. Of, the, the pressure seems to be added week to week on him. Yeah, but that's the game, right? You know, at this level, when you have a... Uh... Uh, you know, especially in the number nine, in those, it, it, this is a bit like the goalkeeper, right? You are the light is shining on you because you're the one that's got to stop the goals, and and, and as the nine, you're the one that's got to score them. And probably, yeah, lack of confidence, probably uh, a little bit tight, probably feeling pressure. It's, you know, that's the that's the game of the top level, right? So, my job as head coach is to support Munsef. My job as the head coach is to believe in him which I 150% do. And, and I believe my job is to keep putting him in the situation because when your team is creating chances and your nine is getting chances, the best way is to is keep putting yourself in the situation, right? And if you believe in yourself and you have people around you that believe in you, your talent will come through in the end. You don't turn into a bad finisher overnight. You don't turn into a bad player. But you do go through ups and downs in your career, right? When you're, Especially when you're a young player and you are you know, making the step into up the ladder through the levels into teams that have more expectation. This is uh, the exciting part of the game as coaches and as players. So the, the, the please, it was Santi that played him in and the pleasing part of that goal is it comes from a pressing moment. We work a lot on high pressing. We work a lot on pressing to create goal chances. We want to be an attacking team in every phase of the game. And although Munsev doesn't score, we've shown that clip 10 times this week in reinforcing excellent play and, and and real aggressive play into a goal chance. He gets that chance again, I, I'm, I'm certain he scores. 
All right. So that was Burke Reese there, a photo of him. He, that's the press where he stepped forward, won the header, and that led to a, this monumental opportunity for Bachrar. And that's the reference I made where he uh, pulled it wide. But he pulled two other shots wide, too. Yeah. So, but just to, to play off what you were saying, you know, Nick pretty much said, yeah, he's, he's feeling the pressure, but that's what happens when you're a striker. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's part of the deal, right? If you want to p- play that position, there's, there's two positions that really shine the light on you. One being striker and mostly being goalie because you cha- because you don't get that many chances. And if you do make a mistake, I mean, it's just magnified, right? right. You can make a mistake in midfield and most likely, you know, the ball goes wide or, you know, somebody makes a save or somebody else behind you protects you. But when you're the last line of defense and you make that mistake, it normally ends up in a goal. And the other way, if you're the last guy who's the possibility to touch the ball and you send it wide or don't do what you're supposed to do, then obviously the light shines on you. It comes with the territory. You have to have a certain mentality, you know, to be able to play the position. You know, some guys are really selfish playing forward or taking all the shots. That's one mentality. You know, there are others. You know, not everybody can be Kobe Bryant. And, um, and I mentioned Kobe Bryant because I- I've become a fan of his mentality, what he calls a mamba mentality, and how he does things and what his thought processes were, his his feelings about failure, which he doesn't believe in the word at all. And that was really interesting. You know, so if you're on Instagram or you have YouTube, go look up, you know, Kobe Bryant and his feelings on all that. There's great life lessons to be learned from that. Bakrar would do great learning from that. Uh, he might be studying that. I don't know. But he's got to be able to apply it. And right now, there's not much pressure behind him because, if we said, Miadovic is in Serbia. Uh, Alonso Martinez hasn't really been given a shot to, to play the position. So, you know, it's his, it's his well, position uh, every Nick week. Much, yeah, Nick, pretty much. He's got no option. Uh, yeah. Bakar will start against New England unless something happens between now and, uh, right. and Saturday. But, but there's going to become a point, and it may become, you know, 60th minute at Yankee Stadium on Saturday, where Nick says, all right, I really do need a goal. This isn't working. And he makes a shift. And, you know, either if Martinez is starting, he puts him in the middle. If he's not starting, he brings him in. But you might have to go to something else. I don't know if using Santi as a nine or false nine is really the answer, because I think that one of the things that Martinez has shown, I mean, he's got great speed and he can get behind defenses. So that's one way to be able to use him. And he's pretty crafty in front of the net. And what Nick has said is that he's got a very good shot and he normally puts it on frame. So if he gets an opportunity, you know, it, it, it will be there. Well, I mean, the, the re- what- you know, when he started with Bakrar uh, at Miami, the uh, the intent was solely for those guys to pretty much run the channels like crazy, both with great pace. And um, to a point it worked out, but they had no connectivity as right. a twin striker. And if you're not connected, then that makes it pretty difficult to have a, a consistent uh, attack. Right. So, so, you know. so he wound up modifying the team considerably midway through the first half. And, you know, all of a sudden you start seeing that they changed formation. And then all of a sudden Martinez was all the way out on the right and they weren't playing two strikers anymore. And it was a simple 4 3 3, if I remember correctly. So, yeah. um, yep. yeah, yeah, he did that. He tried it. He saw it didn't work. Credit to him. He made the change. So, yep. um, good. And then Martinez winds up scoring the goal coming from the right side. Hey, if I could, uh, Kobe Bryant. So I, the, I thought the one of the more um, satisfying things as uh, again, if I could again make reference to those who are getting older and need to maybe figure things out because, especially in athletics, where you're not as fast, you're not, you're just not. You you lose a step or a half a step, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was uh, Kobe Bryant, and I think this was a. I don't know if you saw this when uh, Bill Belichick and Lou Saban, they like did an interview with each other. Like uh, I think it was Belichick interviewing Saban or what. And then he, they were having these conversations and Belichick told the story about Kobe Bryant and asking Kobe about, um, you know, he's 36. How's he still playing or whatever age he was uh, at the end of his career and, and before his tragic passing. I, I, I just remember the vivid part of this is that, he said, "I'm still score. I could still score forty points a night if I want, but I have to do it in a dramatically different way. I can no longer power drive to the basket 
and just take my guy and get through and pass the center or whatever the, the different dribble mm -hmm. drive techniques he had. Now I've got to look at the court more. I've got to really slow things down in my mind. So he like he changed his game to come up with what was really along the way. If you look at st his statistics, the exact same productivity. How cool is that? I mean, and that's what all athletes, that's another, you know, that would be athletes that are, you know, a little bit past their prime. They've got to think about that too. Absolutely. I mean, um, his work ethic was beyond anything that I've ever seen. I mean, he would talk about that. He would get up at four o'clock in the morning, every morning to have a workout. And then he would go back to sleep for a little bit. Then he'd come back, have breakfast and then have another workout. And he said, I had three workouts every day. Everybody else had two. I had one before they all got up in the morning. <laughs> I had one. And so over time, that extra work is going to make me better. Because, yep. you know, it's very focused work. Right. It's very purposeful work. You know, there, there, there were, you know, it wasn't just, I'm just going to go and just do a little shoot around. I mean, he had spe specific drills and specific things that he wanted to work on. And yep. he said, look, over a year, I'm going to have 365 more workouts than anybody else. So that alone is going to make me better than everybody else. And so, you know, when you have that sort of mentality, it's, uh, you know, it's no wonder why he was as good as he, as he is. And so if you're an athlete, you know, and you're going to do this or anything else in, in, in life, you know, you can do that. I mean, there were a lot of sacrifices along the way. I mean, he wasn't out going out to dinner all the time with his, you know, with his teammates. He wasn't going out and drinking. He wasn't doing you know, all the things that you could do with the amount of money that he was making that you would think that somebody his age would do, you know, having that sort of income. It, it was an interesting, purposeful way of doing things and looking. And then there's more stuff about him looking after what he was going to do once he retired and things like that. I mean, it was just just fantastic. Yeah. So going back and to Mike Rock. And he looks at it. Yeah, I am. Um... And the other thing about Kobe, he was uh, one of our soccer guys, too, a real uh, mm -hmm. you know, soccer fanatic. Now, on to the – so, uh, Santi Rodriguez scores from the penalty spot. Uh, he's now two of three from the spot in his career, which either you or someone within the club put out during the broadcast, which was nice information. Uh, and then um, – now, second half comes, and uh, – the replacement for Jacamakis, who is out with a uh, bone bruise, uh, this guy Jamal Tiare, who is uh, you know he's a he's a guy he's a, he's a veteran, um, good forward, uh, but he uh, he scores that goal that equalizer on Brad Guzan just sidewinds a punt, Mosquera a substitute gets in behind, and then Jacamakis replacement in the lineup scores the equalizer in the uh, 65th minute. So, Roberto, here's where I, how I'm going to approach this. So I had a guest on this week on my SiriusXM FC show. If you subscribe to SiriusXM and don't listen to the soccer channel, I don't know what to tell you. It's channel 157. 157. Thank you. And Roberto's a listener. And uh, my guest was Paul Blodgett, a great friend of mine, a goalkeeper savant. I mean, this guy, he's been around for decades. He's worked with some of the best keepers. And I asked him in the interview – what was the one thing, if he could point out, that there were, you know, if there was an overall issue with goalkeeping, you know, globally, whether it's youth uh, or, or pro, and he immediately said, the, he said, weak side, weak side. And then I think, boy, how many goals do you watch every weekend where somebody's just alone at the back post, they nod it in, they volley it in, they collect it and score – it's it's really interesting because it, it comes down to really minute fundamentals sometimes. Well, Tiari scored on the back post. It was off this Guzan punt, Mosquera. Martins was on the defending side of it. So I approached Nick Cushing with this. So the little coaching education here, because I I know uh, you know the coach the gaffer likes to talk footy, man. So if you can bring up something, uh, you'll you'll get a little bit more out of him, I think. And I specifically address this based on a conversation I had with my goalkeeper friend, Paul Blodgett. Listen. Discussed was, uh, for him, goalkeeper, for me, the weak side back, the, the back, that the, the fullback, let's say, on the right side in this uh, instance, is just body position. You know, positioning your body so you can see both the ball and the player that may be coming on. It can be as simple as that, yes? 
Yeah, we did a lot of work this week on that. On that, you know, the five almost the five principles that we have in defending in, in our back line, in setting the line, in defending the goal. You know, body shape for me is the fifth principle of give yourself the best opportunity to react to the situation. And the best way that you give yourself the best opportunity to re react to the situation is by having your body in a position that can see what's happening, that can anticipate what might happen, and that can react to what is happening, whether that be turning and running, whether that be defending the back post, whether that be blocking, or whatever the moment is, you know, your body position is the most pivotal concept of how you can react to what's happening. So that was... Uh... First of all, the uh, the five principles of defending. I'm going to have to follow that up in a in a subsequent conversation with Nick. I would imagine the first one, and th there's been failures here too, are, are closing down and denying service. That's that's always that was always my first principle of defending: deny service, and then you don't have to worry about what's going on in the area. Deny right. service, anybody. But let's weak side defending the back post, the second post, however you want to describe it. Let's put that. Um, that's still that screenshot up because this this makes it really vivid. Uh, and that is uh, Kevin O'Toole. So here's when we're talking about body position, that's Almada, I think, on top of the ball, and then Tiari going towards the back post. Now, you can see if Almada is able to slip that past Burke Risa and in front of Matt Freeze, that's a tap in. Yeah. And Kevin O'Toole has no idea that he's even there. Why? Because of his body position. And that's, you know, I, I this is like defending 101, and it's really interesting to me, and I'm not picking on Kevin O'Toole, because this happened three other times in the game and on Tavon Gray's side. So, and now remember Tyler Wolf got in twice and had free shots in this game. So that's kind of why I brought it up to Nick, too, because it was a pretty frequent happening. I mean, Atlanta had 18 shots on the night, Roberto. I mean, it wasn't like, yeah. you know, you know, we, we talked about New York City with 23. Atlanta had 18. Yeah. That's a lot of shots to concede. But Four big chances and six of them on target. Yeah. But here. Busy night for Matt Freeze. But you see that. So is that vivid to you, that weak side defending right there? Oh, 100%. In terms of body 100%. Position? Yeah, so yeah that, well, we, we see that too often, sadly, but not only in New York City. We see that all over the league. No, no, I mean, all I, over the world. All over yeah. the world. Yeah, for and sure. It, I mean, I thought that one of the things that he might have said as well is playing out of the back. So now in Champions Cup, we got two vivid examples of that as both U.S. goalkeepers, uh, Schulte in for Columbus and uh, Calendar for Miami, g gave away horrific, horrific goals. Yeah. So um, it was Schulte trying to dribble out of the back and getting his pocket picked by uh, by Andre Pierre Guignac, and then just tapping it into an empty net, and then Brandon Vasquez uh, playing a little bit of possum, looking for the pass to go to the middle, and then pouncing on it, and then just tapping it in. And I mean, Columbus was able to recover and win on penalty kicks. Inter Miami was not able to recover from that, even though if they had scored two goals. You know, they and, and it would have been two one. They would have gone to overtime. Now, is there are you are you is there a connection to weak side defending that you're making here? I'm, I'm I wasn't sure. No, I, I the, the connection the connection was the fact that I that I had said that I was surprised not surprised but the one thing that I would add is that and I was sort of you know I I wish he had spoken about it maybe he did was the fact that that's obviously weak side defending is huge but also goalies playing out of the back that is a, that has been a big issue lately as well and not oh. only you know. But well, not only those two examples, we've seen it in the Premier League, you know, we've seen it everywhere. It's just, it's the decision, and I think this is what Wilfred Nancy said after the game, it's like, we, they, they do not, as he put it, you know, I'll paraphrase, our players, our goalkeeper and our backs and our holding midfielders, they do not have to always build out of the back. If they recognize an issue, they are allowed to send it into the next county. We permit that, you know, and that's um, that's where you, you know, that's where you have to make a decision on the field. You do want to break lines. I mean, I, you know what it bothers me, Roberto? All these, oh, God, I, I wish I could remember some of the, you know, pundits who just crush teams that attempt to do this. And I think that's a really wrong uh, analytical approach. You should have both in your back pocket because one of the most effective things 
in this game is breaking lines with either the dribble or the pass. And mm-hmm. if you break that pressure, now you're like 5v5 to goal. And that's what you're, you know, that's for some teams, that's their, that's the way they want to build. It's the way New York City wants to build. Oftentimes you'll see five and five, you know, and that's uh, that's what they want. So what you need, right, the, for, for it to be successful, right, you need people who are very good on the ball, right, who are able to see the pass, make the pass with the right weight, right speed, that sort of thing, put themselves in a position to get I, the ball I, back. I get all I mean, that. All these little different things, right? And and not everybody has that ability. You're going to see it much better in the Premier League or in Spain or in Germany or in or in Italy or France, and you're going to see either in Mexico or the United who, States. Who won, who, won ML, who won MLS Cup last year? Who won MLS it was Cup? Columbus. Yeah, and they did it by breaking lines, man. That's I'm how they not, won MLS Cup. I'm uh, not I'm arguing saying, the point. I'm not saying stop, you shouldn't do it. Stop for a second. I'm saying – the idiotic commentary or what from people who are in the game who just don't like it because every because it's a risk and there is a risk to it but there's a yes. risk reward too and when it happens how many times are these people lauding the times that they broke a line and maybe got it created a chance going the other way that's all i just want everybody to look at it in an even fashion in a balanced fashion yeah so patrick schulte completely screwed up, just a technical malfunction, trying to pull a Cruyff in goal with Gignac right on him. So, um, you know, it's just, he he had a lapse, but then he comes back and saves two penalties and they advance. So, I mean, the guy recovered. So, you know, you got, it's like, I don't know. I like to play the game. See, prob- possible po- part of this is this is the way I like to play the game too. So, well, that's I, fine. You know, Philadelphia uh, Union will never good. do that, right? Matt Freeze, one of the reasons he has difficulties with his feet still is he spent years in the Philadelphia system, and they don't make any passes to their backs. You know, from the goalkeeper, rarely. So mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, and and they're successful with it. So well, I remember John that's Johnson funny. when he fir- when he first came to New York City, right. he had issues with that as well. And Patrick Vieira, well, you know, got the whip on him, and like, oh, you're going to learn how to pass out of the back. And he got much much better at it because that's the way Patrick wanted to play. And then credit to Patrick because I don't know if you remember this when we had our preseason talk with him after the first year. One of the questions that we asked him was about, so wh- what are you doing differently this year? What did you learn? And he basically said. I'm not always going to demand that we play out of the back. There's going to be situations where we jump lines because in his first year, it was like, you're always playing out of the back and there was like no exceptions. And then year two, he was like, all right, I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson and we're going to, and we're going to change. We, you know, we're, we're, we're we're going to, there are going to be times where we're going to jump. We're going to go and jump lines. It, It happened pretty early in his coaching career. His very first game that he coached for New York city was at Chicago and, and, uh, I think it was still Josh Saunders played at the Frederick Brion <laughs> and he lost the ball to uh, who's the uh, Ghanaian. Um, I'm forgetting his name, but anyway, he lost the ball. Next thing you know, it's in the back of the net. And I think that game was, uh, I think New York city lost four or three, or maybe they won four or three, four or three, one four three in Chicago. But so Great um, game. I remember brilliant in the locker room afterwards going like, that's the worst game I ever played. <laughs> Poor Fred. Who's now coaching. I don't know if people know this. Fred, he was with DC United as an assistant. Wayne Rooney said he was going to take him uh, wherever he went. And then Wayne Rooney reneged on his promise. So he was left with nothing. So good job, Wayne Rooney. Uh, and then uh, he is an assistant coach with the Utah Royals in the NWSL um, for um, A-Rod, who is the, the head coach. And um, I'm, Amy Rodriguez, I, I forgot her full name, but we called her A-Rod for years, uh, former national team player. And uh, so good for him because, uh, uh, you know, from what I had heard with D.C., he was running training. I mean, he was running the training sessions right. for, for Rooney, you know, and that Rooney observed this. The players were responding. And I, and I think he he also coached the uh, member Rooney. He left right after that last game. And and um, DC United had some sort of exhibition with somebody. Yeah, that, they they had an exhibition. Yeah, they had one more game, and yeah, Rooney was way gone by then. Yeah, so Brilliant took that game, and they won two one. I forget, it was an El Salvadorian team, I think. And probably. And that was um, that was his DC United swan song as he was uh, left there for a while. So uh, 
How about so Caleb Porter? So on the other side for New England. So it's New England. So I I don't know if you could list this as the marquee matchup of the weekend in MLS. Both teams with one win on the season. New England uh, getting their first victory uh, with with a victory against uh, who they beat Chicago one nil. Who they beat one nil? Why can't I remember? I don't know. And I don't have it written down. Anyway, Carlos Heel. Uh, he scored the game-winning goal. I've got it here. Hold on a second. Yeah, uh, Charlotte. They beat Charlotte one 0 Yes. And Heel scored in the uh, third minute of first half stoppage Stop time, it. and he's certainly a guy that's. Uh, uh, but but Caleb Porter. So he under a, some pressure for sure, as as Nick Cushing has been. Just because if you don't get results, then you start hearing it from the supporters. Well, uh, Caleb Porter in his uh, radio appearance last Thursday before the Charlotte game. He said, the quote, we're going to get a win on Saturday. I promise that. Which he talked back after the game because Dean Smith, the Charlotte coach, said uh, the next day he probably shouldn't make promises he might not be able to keep. And <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, Caleb said, as his retraction, it was not my intention to guarantee a win or disrespect Charlotte. The remark was a throwaway comment at the end of the call, and I realized it was a poor word choice on my part. So he, he brought it back. Well, I wish he wouldn't have brought it back. You guaranteed a win. You said you're going to win. You won the match. Just say, I told you so. That's what I wanted Caleb Porter to say. Start God. some rivalries. Start, start some viral yeah. rivalries against teams that you only play once I a year. I told you we were going to beat you, Dean, and we're going to beat you the next time we play you when we go to Charlotte. <laughs> That's Queen I this. I wish I wish you would have said that. Come on, Caleb. Meanwhile, he didn't guarantee a win against America, did he? Either time. No, no. no. They got yeah, smoked wasn't... for nothing at home. And yeah. then they went to Azteca, which is never an easy place to play. And they didn't play their first team uh, for the most part. You know, they brought some guys in late, but uh they lost five to two. It was uh it was a joke of a game. Uh, Vrioni came in in the second half and got two goals, one in stoppage time. Um, who else came in? Uh, uh, Carlos Heel came in late as well. So Vrioni came in in the 58th minute. Chankalai came in in the 64th. Carlos Heel well, came in in the 73rd. I think the Vrioni point is really, really particularly important. Because here's a striker. He will start at striker on Saturday. I can almost, I'll, I'll go out and I'll do my best Caleb Porter. I guarantee he will oh, start boy. at striker for New England. But uh, he's coming off a two-goal performance off the bench. The New York City striker, Bakrar, still looking for his first. I think that's a really interesting contrast coming into this game. Roberto, well, I think... He's got, hold on. He's got yeah. only one goal in five matches with NMLS. Okay. And he's coming off a two-goal performance. I don't care if it was in the backyard. I'm saying no. he scored two goals, and he's feeling good. He's feeling good. How about Eric Miller, former New York City player? Remember, he played in the back? Yeah. His first MLS goal in 186 games, and it gave Portland a 3-3 tie against Sporting KC in Kansas City. And after they were trailing 3-0. Oh, oh. Shouldn't this be part of kicking it around? I'm getting there. This is oh. still MLS. Okay. How about uh, uh, – that, that's it. Let's kick it around. <laughs> I never I'll, understand I'll, when kicking I'll around you... starts. I mean, it's a whim on your part by this point. Well, yeah, and I'll and I'll I'll give you the opportunity to organize the entire <laughs> podcast in subsequent weeks so you can figure out when it's kicking it around. No, it's all good. I, because, I just go with the flow, Glenn. Just go with the flow. We're still staying with MLS, but we're gonna switch to the Board of Governors meeting this past week, Roberto. Uh -huh. And this was pretty significant news because there are budget adjustments that are gonna go into effect. We don't know exactly when. But uh, designated players and U22 initiative, three DPs and three U22 initiative players will be permitted or two DPs and four U22 initiative players. Now, that's a change from uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics, but it was it was a, a much more constraining as to how you could bring in uh, the big players on designated player contracts and still maintain that. Well, most of them come from South America, so I'll just say the South American connection for these uh, U-22 initi uh, initiative players. And then 
The one that I think is pretty interesting, and I asked Nick Cushing specifically about this on our pregame show, 7.15 on the New York City FC Network, uh, the full uh, 13 minutes with Nick, and, and we talk about this one. The current rule right now will limit transfer fees to be converted into GAM to be used to get more players. So Tati Castellanos transfers to Lazio, 15 million bucks in the bank. New York City, you know how much of that they could use? 1.215 million to acquire more players. Unbelievable. <laughs> so that figure is going to go up to $3 million that you can oh, that's use. that's good. Out of the, whatever the transfer, I just used the fifth million mark as an example. No, it's fine. Yeah. So it's that's a, that's another player, at least another good player, right? Or, or several good players, depending. I mean, if you you know you can you can live in this league on defenders who are making three hundred thousand dollars, and you can get you know a whole new back four. Um, you know, forwards a different ball game. Attacking midfielders are a different ball game. It's not enough. It's good. It's not enough. It's just not enough. And you, you, you look, Columbus was able to survive and beat Tigres, right? And when you start making these comparisons, you can't just talk about how MLS is going to do within MLS. Because at the end of the day, right, FIFA World Cup has now gotten big. It's like a huge tournament now. And we're talking about the Club World Cup. Obviously, you've got uh, Champions Cup. Leagues Cup in a different way, you know, which is extremely weighted towards MLS player MLS teams because of the fact that they don't play in Mexico, although this year was adjusted a bit, so there's not as much travel, but it's still a disadvantage, right? But when you start playing, the, the biggest test is Champions Cup, and you've got to see how you measure up. And even with those, I guess, opening up a little bit of the salary cap, you can't measure up against teams that can spend – willfully and without a cap and you have anywhere between four and six teams in mexico that are going to be able to spend whatever the hell they want and a lot of them spend above 40 million sometimes up to 60 million and sometimes even more and mls teams you know aside from the miami can spend 50 million on one player right it's a different way of measuring and it's just if you really want to compete and compete and win, okay, Champions Cup, as opposed to having a puncher's upset, you know, here and there, like, you know, they had with Seattle because they got Pumas, who wasn't a good team, but Pumas was able to, you know, win some games that they weren't supposed to win, and they got to the final, and then Seattle tied I, them in Mexico well, and let, beat them home. I've got a question for you after. So you they got to spend more. They've got to open up the salary cap. And, if the, and the problem is the owners that are, more interested in the bottom line than they are in winning and losing. Well, you know? here, I thought that this was a, a pretty um, a pretty solid reflection as to you know you, people within the league, whether they're it's in the league offices or within these teams that play in Major League Soccer. Uh, I, I find it interesting sometimes that um, the the word I used to use to describe people who were maybe um, you know, uh, a, a little out of touch, overinflated value of their own self-worth. A guy named John Korf, who was a tennis promoter, used that to describe tennis players once because they have large egos, for the most part, professional tennis players. Overinflated value of your own self-worth. MLS has so far to go to be to capture the global audience, let alone the domestic audience, right? Listen to this. What's this? LAFC, LA Galaxy, pretty El Trafico, right? Biggest rivalry in MLS. It's it's in there. It's in that mix, right? Mm -hmm. Averaged two hundred and eleven thousand viewers on Fox. Manchester United versus Liverpool, one point five million viewers on NBC. Now it might not be a, an, an you know it might not be a completely accurate apt description, but I put that down in my notes because I want folks to know and. I hear about it all the time when, cause I, I hang with people that I, I think I, I'm sure I told you the story. I hung up with someone once that they, they didn't know who Lionel Messi was. We just assume because we're in this niche, you know, and MLS clubs are in this niche MLS in the offices are in this niche. We, we, who do we hang with? We hang with a lot, mostly soccer people. So they know, but it's, um, 
my I don't my larger point here is t- twofold. Like, first of all, and I know what your answer is going to be, and maybe you can explain it from you. You can represent those that really think it's so important that we compete with Liga MX. I I don't. I've never gotten too crazed about that. Okay, I just haven't. Let's just you know, I I just haven't. And it, at least MLS is moving in a direction where maybe eventually they'll get to the point where you want to get Roberto, and maybe the gradual movement. You have to. It's been a pretty successful business model. You'd have to say. And it is, I mean, as far as the, the, the TV broadcast, we don't know what the Apple numbers are. So that game was broadcast on MLS season pass for free. All Fox games are broadcast on MLS season well, pass We're not, not going to count. Yeah, we don't know. And we're not going to count it yeah. because we never know. So screw them. We're not well, going to screw them, but uh, you got to give that as context. Well, but I mean, the even the NWSL the game so had, yeah, had the number the ratings, right. Give or the, the USL game, rather. I think there was a USL game on CBS that had, larger numbers than, than the Fox game. There, I mean, there, there might be a multitude of reasons for that. Uh, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get crazy, but look, the thing is, is that this isn't the NBA. This isn't the NFL. This isn't major league baseball where you are playing isolated in a bubble where you you are in a league that by the way, is looking to compete with Mexico because Mexico has a lot of Mexicans here that can be customers for MLS and you're trying to get them interested in your league and you exhibit your league by playing against teams that they recognize and that they know which are teams from their country. So and still the Mexican national team and Mexican soccer is still the number one soccer product in this country. And people yeah. should know that. So it's understandable yeah. that you may want to go and say, hey, look, you can go root for Chivas, but, you know, you can come and, you know, root for Seattle, too. Or root for New York City, too, whatever it is. And yeah. so, you know, that's part of the reason why they're doing all these things. The MLS All-Star Game is against Liga Mekis again this year. And I, so I, I love that's competition. why, but you got to compete. But if you're yeah. going to compete with these teams and you're going to compete with these leagues, then you, if, you've got to be able to compete equally. And they can't because there's an artificial cap placed on by MLS owners that doesn't allow teams to be able to compete equally. MLS teams always have a puncher's chance against Mexican teams, but that's what they have. And if they were all to play four out of seven, they ain't winning one. Yeah. They're just not winning one. They're not good enough because so the other teams are able to bring in more talent. Your overall point then would be is that we hear from the MLS offices so often about the importance of competing favorably with the Mexican teams, yet you're saying MLS doesn't put the teams in a position to be able to do that. It's lip service. It's lip service. It's great PR. Oh, we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that and look how close we came and, you know, we made a final or we made a semifinal and, and yeah, but they know they have realistically no chance because of the fact that the other teams are able to outspend them by quite a bit of money. And not only that, they can take that $40 million and break it down any which way they want down their roster. They don't have the top heavy, oh, well, we're paying this guy $8 million and this guy $12 million and this guy $6 million. Yeah. No, it's more evenly divided. And so you have a much more solid team and you have a much more solid bench. You can bring guys in off the bench that are going to absolutely change the game. And MLS, those guys don't exist as much as they do for the Mexican national, you know, for all the Mexican teams. All right. And that's the difference. I'm going to go out on a limb and whoever wins the striker battle, I don't know if this is much of a limb to go out on, but Vrioni or Bakrar, one of those two is going to win the game on Saturday, New England wow. at New York city FC at Yankee stadium. First, Roberto Abramowitz and Ariel Hudis at 6 p.m. They have their pregame live stream, okay? Then myself and Maddie Lawrence, we do our pregame live stream at 6.45. Then the both of us, Roberto in Spanish, myself in English, uh, pregame show for the live commentary beginning at 7.15 and then kickoff at 7.40 p.m. So, look, I uh, hope you... uh, I hope you enjoy the game if you're going to be there. Uh, if not, consider tuning in to us and syncing up with the video. And otherwise, it was nice of you to join us. Another live NYCFC views, which you can uh, listen back to as well. So, Roberto, good stuff. For Roberto Abramowitz, I'm Glenn Crooks. This has been NYCFC views. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast NYCFC Views on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. 
Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.